All righty. Looks like the entrances have slowed down a bit. So welcome to engaging the local community through arts, events, and programming. Uh, we are delighted to have you for day two. Uh, we have Natalie Phillips, Aaron Williams, and Kristen Reeves visiting us from Muncie today to talk about um, their experiences and uh, to provide their wisdom, I suppose. Before I hand it off to them to get started, uh, just a couple of couple of small housekeeping items, right? So I mentioned a second ago, keep yourself muted until we get to the Q&A. Once we get to the Q&A, feel free to turn on your mic, turn on your camera, and turn it into a conversation, all right? In the meantime, please um, use the chat any old time, ask questions, we'll get to them later, um, share resources, whatever, whatever pops up along the way, right? Uh, if you want to rename yourself uh, in the in the chat list, you can do that by hovering over your uh, yourself, clicking on the three dots that should appear, and then you'll have a choice to rename, and you just type in and um, go from from whatever whatever uh, blue bu blue bunny kind of um, name you have on there to your actual name. That's great. Captioning is um, on and available during during the session. If you go to the ribbon at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see uh, something that says live transcript with a little CC and you can click on that and, and see the live caption scroll going through. And if you have any questions along the way of a technical <coughs> nature, something isn't working right, um, please go into the chat, pop a question over to Deanna, um, who's listed as Deanna Polsman, IAC Tech and she'll get you to the right sort of place. So with that, I am going to back away and hand the stage off to our lovely presenters. Sound like a plan? Yeah. All righty, go get them. Okay. So uh, can everyone see my PowerPoint okay? Hopefully, thumbs up. Okay, uh, so I'm Natalie Phillips and let me... Okay. Okay, so I am the coordinator for Muncie's First Thursday events. Those are our monthly arts walk or gallery crawl type things. Um, I can put it on, on this slide here. These are some of our little ad photos. Uh, and so what I do is, or what First Thursday is, is on the first Thursday of every month, our individual downtown artist venues and businesses, they all plan events together from 5 to 8 p.m. And uh, it's every single month uh, and, and a lot of people participate, which is nice. So what I do is as the coordinator, um, I help artists find spaces to exhibit in if they're looking for them. Uh, I help to recruit new venues. I answer questions, kind of the point person. And then the biggest thing I do each month is uh, people send me information about their events that I call together. I put them in one kind of neat file, uh, send out a press release, do the promotions, social media, all that good stuff. Um, so that's what our first Thursdays are. Uh, I realized this morning that this year is our 20th anniversary of first Thursday. So we're gonna have to think of something to do in the next two months to celebrate that before 2021 is over. Um, so it's been around a long time. There hasn't always been a coordinator position. So I've been doing it for about seven years. The guy before me, uh, who you see breathing fire on the left of there, did it for about five years. So there's a considerable period without a coordinator. Um, if you want to do something like this in your hometowns, I, I do recommend having some sort of point person because it helps organize things, helps give a central location for questions and just to figure out what's going on for, uh, for that month. Um, and mine is a volunteer position, but uh, anytime I think that if you can apply for grant money and give a small stipend for any kind of volunteers, that helps with the, the burnout factor a little bit. Um, I, I knew what I was getting into when I, I volunteered. So, uh, but anyway, it, it can be helpful. Um, so my goal as the first Thursday coordinator since I started has been to bring in a greater variety of art and of types of art that people can see in different artists. 
Um, and also to get people to branch out and to go to different venues that they maybe haven't visited before. Um, and Muncie is really lucky in that we already have a really wide variety of art venues. So we've got something like Cornerstone in this big, beautiful building. They show fairly traditional arts like landscape painting. They have an annual high school show. Uh, we've got Ply Space, which Erin is in charge of. And they do a lot of fun, experimental, kind of avant-garde performance type stuff. And then we've also got uh, Mad Jacks, which every month a ton of artists get together and sell their wares in a sort of monthly art bazaar type thing. So usually pretty inexpensive price points. And then we've got everything in between, which is nice. So we've already got, got a wide variety. Um, but the, the trick is, or the question is, how do you get someone who usually just goes to say Cornerstone to branch out and go to a place like Ply Space where maybe it's kind of art that they're not familiar with. And it can be, it can be tricky because people certainly tend to stick to their, their kind of usual haunts. Um, but there are some clever ways that you can get them to move out of their comfort zone a little um, and go, go see some different types of art. So that's what I'm going to talk about here briefly um, and just talk about a few quick common sense tips for bringing new art audiences to your event, whether it be a monthly gallery crawl or just a singular event. And they are really common sense things based on my experience, but you'd be surprised how many people forget some of the, the basics uh, sometimes. So it's a good reminder to have. So the first one is um, make sure that in your description, your ad for the event, that you include a clear description. Um, so don't just have a, a title that's very artsy and vague. You want to tell people the who, what, the when, and the where. Um, I can't even tell you how many emails I've received that have this long description of the event, but then forget to say where the event is being held um, or what time it is, or sometimes what the event even is at times. So good communication is key um, and just making it clear to the public. And, and I've learned that too on my side is I, I'm an academic and so academics communicate in a very different way than uh, than you know, the average person. So I've sort of learned to adapt to my communication to be clearer as well uh, when interacting with people. Um, also be clear about what guests can expect. And I think this is really important as far as accessibility goes. Um, if physical activity is, or participation is involved, make sure people know about it. Um, sometimes people are shy and they don't wanna necessarily participate or need to feel comfortable or prepared. Um, and especially with physical activity, sometimes someone might be in a wheelchair or they might have a kind of some sort of invisible disability that maybe they don't wanna disclose. So you don't wanna put them in an awkward position. Um, and just as an example, uh, from my own experience, I remember a long, long time ago, uh, I wanted to go to this performance event and it also had a very vague description and I just had knee surgery. So I hobbled my way on down there. Uh, and as soon as I got there, I realized it actually involved pretty heavy physical activity from the participants. So I had to turn right around and, and leave. Um, and that was a temporary uh, issue for me, but you don't wanna put anyone in an awkward position. You wanna make sure everyone feels comfortable at your event. And then speaking of feeling comfortable, doing something as simple as having somebody at the door to greet guests can go such a long way. Um, and I say this as someone who's, who's pretty shy normally, like I'm terrible at schmoozing. I hate, I hate that kind of stuff. So I kind of get very awkward in situations like that. So just having someone say, hello, welcome. Uh, the performance will be over here and start at this time can go a really long way in making people feel welcome. And everyone here's, you know, in the arts, you know that sometimes there can be like, Art events can occasionally feel clicky, or if you're not accustomed to attending them, um, you maybe feel like you don't know the rules or how to behave. So something just as simple as a point person at the door um, is a huge thing. 
Um, and then lastly, design events that encourage people to move around and visit multiple locations. So this is another one that helps get people out of their comfort zone. And our downtown development office um, is absolutely brilliant at doing stuff like this. So I wanted to share a few of their events. Uh, in the fall, they do what's called the soup crawl, where they have at certain locations, art events and restaurants and businesses, they set up on the sidewalk and uh, each location has a different kind of soup. Um, they're usually really, really good soups too. Uh, and if you buy a ticket, you can get a little cup of soup at each location, which is really nice in the, the cold fall weather. Um, and so it gets people moving, gets them maybe to stop in a store that they wouldn't normally go to or see a show they wouldn't normally go to. The same thing uh, is in the spring, but called flower hour, where instead of soup, uh, they give you a flower at each location. And that's really fun because at the end of the night, you end up with a big bouquet of flowers. And it's really fun to walk around at the end of the, the that particular celebration because everyone's just carrying these big bouquets like they're Miss America or something. So it's really joyous and celebratory. Um, and again, gets people moving around the city and brings business to, um, to the locations as well. And then lastly, I thought I'd mention um, the elf hunt. This was uh, over Christmas. I think technically designed mostly for kids, but I participated and had a blast. Uh, and what you would do is in each of the, the downtown business windows, there is an elf and you had to, you got a sheet and you had to name at least 50 elves and their locations. So I had tons of fun running around the city and um, I, I noticed businesses that I had literally walked by every single day and didn't notice where they were before. And so it was even a good way for natives that live there um, to explore their own cities. So it was really kind of a cool event. Um, so there's a lot of different variety of ways that you can get people to feel more comfortable, go outside of their comfort zones um, and uh, explore new art territory. So that's it for me. I'm gonna kick it over to Erin Williams now. Let me stop my screen share. Here we go. Un unmute myself too, you know, you think you'd figure that out by now. All right, so just a second here, let me share my screen with you. Without opening anything I don't want to open. All right, so I'm picking up where Natalie left off. My name is Erin Williams. I am the executive director of the Muncie Arts and Culture Council. Um, hopefully everyone can hear and see me okay. I can see Natalie, so she's gonna nod and let me know. Um, so what I wanna talk about a little bit today, we all are sort of arriving at this idea of um, community engagement and community um, collaboration in different ways. And the Muncie Arts and Culture Council does a lot of different types of projects, but one that I'm gonna focus on today is our residency program, which really has a really interesting way, I think, of engaging with the community and um, I know when I listen to presentations like this, I like to, you know, I love to hear the theory and the ideas behind, you know, what you do or why you do it, but I also really like to see the practical way that it can be applied. So um, I'm going to spend some time today going over that as well. So hopefully I won't go way over time. Let me set my little timer here. Um, okay. So this is Ply Space. This is actually the building that we are in um, for our offices. It is a residency and it is a gallery. And um, you know, the Muncie Arts and Culture Council has a pretty uh, long relationship with Muncie. We started in about 2011. And um, during that time, we initially started as more of a professional practice organization that would provide classes and, and information to local creative folks who wanted to sort of expand in their knowledge. Uh, and what ended up happening is, is in 2018, um, our organization grew exponentially. Um, and all of a sudden we found ourselves uh, as recipients of a National Endowment for the Arts grant to start the Ply Space program, um, which involved then us having a building and then having a gallery and managing artist projects um, all year. So as part of that project, 
you know, we really had to jump through some hoops and get used to uh, what it was going to be like to be embedding ourselves in the community in a much more direct way that was different from just working with uh, local creative folks that want to learn something new and maybe just stop by a, a class or something like that. So that's what really um, was really a big change for us. And I wasn't there during that time. I started, um, just to give you a little background, uh, right in 2018. So I can't speak too much about what happened before that point, but I can tell you a whole lot about PySpace. Um, and also, I wanted to just also point out a few things about our community, because one of the, I think, most important things about working in a community or with a community or getting community to be engaged with your projects is knowing who they are. And, um, you know, like other small Rust Belt towns, uh, Muncie is a really specific uh you know, university town, we have Ball State University. We also have a, a generally lower rate of a household income. We have, um, you know, a wonderful community of people that are very creative and very excited to be involved. But we don't have a community that has necessarily a lot of money. We don't have a community that um, always has the same sort of accessibility as other places might have. So understanding what those different hurdles might be is really important. I guess I can't hit my down arrow. I'm just gonna click through. So we are basically an umbrella organization um, that has about five projects right now that are sort of our cornerstones and PlySpace is the one I will talk about now. But I wanted to just quickly highlight BoxBox, which is another program that we do where we have um, the opportunity for the public to paint um, traffic boxes. And it's a pretty robust program. At this point, we've done 70 boxes over the last three years, which is really amazing. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to make a note of is that when you do projects like BoxBox Box or things that can really just get into the community in a physical way, you can really see members of the community come out and get behind those projects because they feel like they have a stake in what's going on. Uh, if you don't get projects really in front of them so that they really feel like they have the opportunity to participate, it's really easy for people to just sort of tune out. So some of the processes that we sort of think a lot about when we're going into a new project um, is specifically knowing your community, listening to your community, constantly evolving and growing as your community does, and then thinking about where we need to cut the fat or where we need to cancel programs if we need to. So I'll break that down a little bit more. Um, so knowing your community is, is different than just listening to your community. So um, if you know your community, that means that you really are deeply engaged. You're down there in the trenches, you're with people that maybe you don't live next to or have in your same neighborhood, but you are, you're there with them in a really concerted and uh, dedicated way. You're not just swooping in to do a project and then leaving again, or, you know, coming in to do a project and then, and then never coming back. That's something else that happens a lot with community-based projects um, from, you know, organizations that might be, be or be perceived as being somewhat external. Um, so one of the ways that we do this, or we really try to do this, and I will, I will say right now, we're not experts at it. We are always reevaluating what we're doing. So I don't want anyone to think that we're doing this perfectly because we're not, we're trying as hard as we can to do the best work that we can, but there's always improvement. So, you know, that's why I'm at this, uh, um, this homecoming too, is just to learn more. Um, but one thing we've noticed is that really learning where your, how your community can, um, communicates with each other, where they find their communication is really key. And that can be different depending on the neighborhood you're in. Sometimes a neighborhood might be uh, really drawn to a coffee shop or a local business, and that's where they get a lot of their information. Sometimes it's a local business owner or a local family or a group of families that sort of drive, you know, the knowledge base around the community. And sometimes it's different things like Facebook or Craigslist or Instagram. You don't always know where your, your community is going to be getting their information. So getting the word out is like the first thing we always think about who's going to need to know um, about the project that we're doing. Then you also wanna meet them where they are. So that can mean two different things. That can mean physically, as in going to where they're, lo they're located. So if you wanna do a project on a different side of your city and you really want uh, those people to be participating, don't put the project far away from them, put the project in their neighborhood, put the project somewhere where they can access it. But it also means you know meeting them uh, financially and sort of 
uh, informationally at the place that they are at, um, understanding that your community is made up of a lot of different types of people and they may not all love art. Some might hate art, but they're still going to be around it. So how do you bring people into this sort of love and appreciation for creative projects that you have that maybe other people in the community don't just initially share? There's a lot of work that has to be done there in knowing the community. And then finally, you want to watch out for unexpected access barriers. And, you know, we got really used to that, everybody with COVID, you know, who has a computer, who doesn't have a computer, do you have internet, there's those really bare bones sorts of access barriers. But another access barrier that we don't always think about is um, past experience in a community. So if you have a community that has been strategically or um, consistently left out of public programming or has been ignored by the, um, the the city in general, or you know, just has, has been marginalized for different reasons, they may have a very different relationship with a public project or a community engaged project than, than you think they would. So just assuming that everyone would be on board for something is really uh, something we had to learn pretty quickly not to do, that there's definitely people who are excited, but there's definitely people who are not, and there's a reason that they're not excited. And so finding out what that barrier is, is really critical. Also listening to the community, you know, that is a lot more, you know, people talk about this a lot now and it's a really wonderful thing is, is kind of getting down and dirty with your community and asking them what they want, not just assuming that you know or assuming that you're gonna give them what they want, like that's your job. Your job is really to listen to what they wanna do. Um, and, and a lot of that involves spending time where they spend their time looking at the activities that they are interested in or want to be interested in. And also keeping an eye on who has the dominant voice. You know, is there a person in your community that's the gatekeeper? Maybe in a neighborhood, it's a neighborhood association. Maybe that neighborhood association makes all the decisions for the neighborhood, or maybe they just make recommendations, or maybe they're not a gatekeeper at all. Maybe they just happen to be there, but there's really somebody down the street who actually is the one that uh, gives everybody the info, you know, gives them, lays out what's, what's going on and why, why they should be involved. So there's a lot of interesting nuances there to um, pay attention to. And uh, the last thing is when you have a community that um, has a lot of aspects to it, there really are um, different areas that get voices in different areas that don't. And so deciding whether your project needs to be for the community at large, or is it for a specific subset of people that maybe don't have a voice and deserve to have one. Um, also evolving and growing is another thing we've learned a lot about. Um, you know, you can't assume that anything is going to be stagnant or repetitive or that the community you work with one time is gonna be the same one you come back to. So you can always go back and, and ask yourself, what are you doing now that you could do differently? Um, and what's your community's bandwidth for new programs? So um, always bringing something new to the table isn't always the best idea. Sometimes people like to see some repetition and sometimes they need to see something new. So really kind of assessing where that is. Um, and finally, who benefits? Who's getting the actual benefit out of the project? Um, and always going back and asking yourself those questions um, and seeing if those are the actual people that need to benefit. And finally, don't be afraid to let it go if it's not working. It's a little, my little shout out to Frozen. You know, every time I see this slide, I start to sing. But it really is, you know, important to always come back and reassess how your projects are doing and to understand that they may not all be successful and that's okay. Um, but the most important thing is that you are flexible and able to respond to that. So up next, I wanna show a few projects from the Ply Space program, and I will try not to be too long-winded here, but I get really excited about it. Um, so this first project is one that we did during the pandemic um, with the artist uh, Natan Daikin Furtado. And Natan was really fantastic. He applied to be a resident in Muncie for 12 weeks prior to the pandemic, and we had to postpone and sort of reconfigure his project and his ideas as we were working with him um, before he arrived in Muncie. And Natan came as a fellow, which um, is a sort of a subset of our program that allows the artists to work with Ball State. So most of the projects I'm gonna show you here are fellow projects just because they have a little bit more of a broad reach. Um, although we do community projects with all of our residents. And I'm happy to, if you ever have questions about anything with our program, feel free to email me. That email is at the end of this um, 
presentation. So when Natan was here, uh, one of the first big hurdles we had was where we were going to put him because normally we give all of our artists external um, studio spaces. And what that does is it puts them in the community as an artist with other artists who are working in the studio spaces. So that generally is a really nice way to practice, but you can't do that during COVID. So instead, what we did was offer the entire gallery to Natan to work in, and he set up his studio space in the corner and then proceeded to conduct different virtual open studios. We did have a gallery exhibition for him um, that was sort of like a one person in at a time event. Um, it, not a lot of people were really ready to come out um, in the fall of 2020. So that was okay. You know, we didn't, we weren't, our feelings weren't broken, but we just, you know, tried to really kind of pay attention and figure out, you know, what was gonna work best for people. Um, but one of the ways we really wanted to make sure we had a lot of connection was through Instagram and Facebook and other social media. So for Natan's project, what he ended up doing with the Ball State students in the 2D design area is he developed a series of uh, short workshops that were conducted over Instagram that had the students looking at patterns in their neighborhoods and going outside being, you know, by themselves if they needed to, they could do it from home if they were in quarantine and just kind of thinking about the patterns that live around them. So then Natan would, he would zoom in with the classes because he wasn't allowed to actually be in the classes. And then he would conduct these workshops that would then be posted on um, the Instagram page. So we ended up with a series of uh, Instagram lessons that then could also be followed by the public. They didn't just have to be followed by the students in the class. So our final sort of project for the students was this digital quilt. And the thing that was really nice about it was thinking about these sort of tangible experiences of working in quilting and working in pattern development, but then translating them back into the digital because we couldn't be together. But then you also have this collaborative practice that starts to happen. So even though you are digital, you still are collaborating and have a community element. So when we finished that part of the project, we were concerned that the rest of the world didn't get a chance to see it because we were so excited about, it was over 500 submissions to the project. So it was really, really successful. Um, so what Natan and I decided to do is have a um, external viewing that would be safe for the public. We started it off kind of small the first time with a single projector doing um, a projection large scale on the side of our building. But we ended up expanding that to be a multiple projector event that we did um, on the Ball State campus so that both the students could also experience what their work looked like in a larger different sort of scale, but also so that we could create a public event out of it. And in the end, this project uh, traveled to Northeast Indiana. So it, it actually has a long life. Um, Natan has continued to do the project in other locations with different residencies. And just kind of a breakdown of the different communities that were engaged with this project. Um, the local community got to meet with a visiting artist and that included the university students working with a visiting artist who's a professional in his field. We also had students um, working in the local community. So some of the students in that class, which is a freshman class, um, have never been into the downtown area and they came down into the downtown area and had to interact with folks for the first time um, because of the exhibition opportunities. Um, the university students also had their work shown in multiple locations in Indiana. So there was an extension into the broader network there. And the university um, consistently working with us as a nonprofit. So you have these two separate bodies of, of kind of intellect and management that are working together. Um, and finally, the beauty of the pandemic that everybody, you know, this is like the one good out silver lining is that, you know, the web-based community, you know, all over got to participate in some of our projects. So the next one I'm going to go through here and I'll, I'll be kind of quick here, um, is the project by Meredith Cooey. This happened in 2018. Um, this project was called Muncie Memories and Meredith is a social, um, a social practice artist um, and researcher. And she's from Atlanta and she does a lot of um, storytelling and story work uh, projects that involve uh, digital um, collection of stories and digital elements um, to create human archives. So while in Muncie, what Meredith did was work 
in a mobile interview booth and meet with numerous different um, organizations around town to collect the stories of the people who live here. And she did this in a lot of different ways. Uh, she worked with a team of five uh, Ball State interns who helped her with a lot of this project. They helped her set up the booths. They helped her sit the booths. Um, we had 13 different locations that she was at across 12, 12 weeks or eight weeks, between eight and 12 weeks. Um, she also had this great map that she would bring to different locations and throughout the whole project, um, she invited participants to tell their story about a location, pin the location on the map and then give the location a tag. So these locations ended up being like my first kiss, my favorite hot dog, my favorite, you know, view for the sunset. So they were really wonderful. Sometimes they were weird and sometimes they didn't make any sense to us, but they were, they were kind of a great way to have the community just look at this weird social project, but have a, a way to, to interact directly. Um, in the end, we had a gallery exhibition um, that was a living archive. So we had a wide range of different items that were on view. So we had everything from the map that Meredith created to um, stories that she had collected. She collected, I think, over 50 or 100 stories from local, uh, just local people um, at the interview booth. And so we had those stories running in different ways. Sometimes they were um, set with music or sometimes they were set with video. We also had, she collected different types of paraphernalia from around Muncie that she thought was really, you know, indicative of sort of Muncie's character. So we had Muncieopoly playing um, in one area. We had a number of different weird things that she'd found on the railroad tracks and things she found in the trash. We had a um, a, a series of clips and um, old slides from the Boys and Girls Club that came out of a closet that she happened to, you know, end up with just because she was chatting with somebody who worked there. So it was a really interesting way to see an artist from outside of a community end up in a community and really become embedded. So, so one another picture of just what the mobile interview booth looked like that was all over in 2018. So in the end, we ended up having, again, the local community really engaging with the visiting artist in a very direct and holistic way where she was spending a lot of time in the community with people. Um, and it was community centered. The, the project was never about her. It was never about what are we collecting? It was about people telling their stories. It also put the university students, even though it was a smaller number, um, really in direct communication with the community in a way that they don't normally have the chance to, to dive in that deeply. Um, and the community got to inter interact with each other in a way that is a little bit different by having these different story sharing moments and seeing other people interact with an interview booth before you do, you sort of start to have this connection between the different types of stories and people that are in your community. So another project that was also very community oriented and very um, independent was um, the artist by the, the work by artist Anna Lablina, who came from Germany um, this spring. And Anna was really interested in looking at the kind of wonderful world of bread and dough. She initially had applied to come and do some workshops where she was going to be performing with dough, bread dough. But when the pandemic happened, we had to sort of change the trajectory there. So um, the project became much more um, internal and Anna basically ran the project from the kitchen of the residency. She collected all sorts of local recipe books and information from local folks about what kind of recipes they're making. She had numerous different outreach methods from, she posted on Facebook and Craigslist and all kinds of message boards that she found. She posted in all of the coffee shops, anywhere she thought people might see something about sharing their recipes with her and sharing their, um, their experiences making with her too. That was sort of the other part of the project. And so this is the bearded baker who uh, was one of her sort of allies that she worked with here. Um, but she was all over the place. And the funny thing about this project was I didn't even know what she was working on half the time. She would just pop in and out of the residency off to do something else. And it wasn't until the end of the residency when she presented her work that we realized how broad and how wide um, her research base ended up being. 
Um, and this other picture here, I just wanted to point out too, is one of our community gems. It's the Ross Community Center on the south side of Muncie. Um, it's a really wonderful place that um, is a sort of a, a beacon in the middle of that particular neighborhood. And so many of our residents have gravitated towards it without even our, you know, even pushing them that direction. Um, mostly because they just have a really, you know, kind of open arms and very down to earth atmosphere. So um, Anna did go down to the Ross Center. She worked with them. We had another resident, I'll just throw this in there, that um, joined the Euchre Club in order to meet more people and be part of you know, the community in that way so that she could learn about feminist stories during her project, that was a couple years ago. Um, but it was just so funny that you, know, you would just, you can jump in there and dive in and then just really be embedded. Um, Anna also taught uh, bread making techniques to sculpture students at the School of Art. So that became a second part of her outreach process. Um, she conducted critiques with those students about sort of using sculptural elements of bread. And really the thing that she brought back at the end um, that I found really poignant was she, she talked a lot about how bread is sort of this, has this ecology ecological factor to it, where if you look at ecologies in different environments, they tend to stay very siloed. And that is something that happens also with neighborhoods. So when you have neighborhoods that don't interact with each other, they lose that, that kind of interconnection that um, is the same with biology. So when you have things like bacteria, or in her case, yeast or bread, those can actually be things that live on those edges of ecology um, and cause different entities to interact in new ways. So again, breaking it down, um, the local community really got to be involved with Anna in a number of different ways. I can't even talk about all the different ones because I don't even know, but, but it was such a, kind of a magical way to have people um, interact with someone that, that's kind of new, pops into town, but then really embeds themselves. Um, the university students got to work with an international artist. Um, they also got to expand the community that was visible to them. There was a lot of elements of Muncie that they don't see or get to interact with. Um, and then participant to participant in this project was also really key because you had participants who um, were sharing their, their bread recipes and sharing their, starter dough, their sourdough starter with each other, even though they've never met. And then you would end up with sourdough starter in your fridge and you didn't know the person who it came from, but it has this really intimate um, experience as it has traveled from person to person to get to you. So finally, I'm just going to show one last project, which was called Peace Love Dance. Um, this was a project we did with the Ball State Dance Department with the artist India Childs from um, Atlanta. And India wanted to do some really dedicated public research about sort of the, the world of the creative um, and how that world interacts um, with, with sort of some of the, the social dilemmas that we have going on, you know, with racism, sexism, gender, identity, all of the different things that have been very hot topics and obviously should be, um, you know, she really was wondering about like what the interaction between those elements are and um, the creative practice. So the creative use of difference um, series was how we helped her do that. We set up a series of four different panel discussions. They were all done on Zoom. They included a resident from Muncie and also a resident of her choosing from somewhere else in the US. Some were from Atlanta, some were from Chicago, some were from California. Um, and they just created a little dialogue um, between these people that had a similarity in some manner, but you know, were coming at it from maybe a different direction. So the four that we offered was uh, the first was the art of politics that looked at different sort of political messaging or ways that you could use design and art to change um, policy. The second was the black woman creating, which looked specifically at uh, black female identifying artists who um, were working in black feminism and social justice. Um, we also had women shifting the space, which was additional kind of female centered discussion, but that looked at visibility and leadership in the creative arts. And then finally, it's not listed here, we had um, the new policies of dance that really wrapped up all of these topics, but looked at them specifically in the context of the dance world. 
So through this project, what India did was collect all of this data from these discussions that she moderated, the four different discussions. Um, she took the data back with her to um, Atlanta since she was doing it all uh, virtually. She didn't have to be here in Muncie for the beginning part. And she um, sort of collated it into a creative uh, collaboration with the Ball State students. Uh, she started having uh, individual Zoom sessions where she would teach them choreography that she was developing based on the conversations that happened in the community. And I'm just going to show you what the output was at the end. She worked with a filmmaker named Josh Cleveland and a composer, and they put together this really amazing project um, that's a, about a 25 minute film. I'm just going to show you the preview of it, but that um, looks at each element of peace, love, and dance as a different chapter of um, this sort of creative experience. So bear with me. I'm going to do a little stop share. And I'm going to open this up for you. The moment you walk into a community, you can't really create work for a community unless you become a part of it. And until we understand the community that we're in conversation with, we're not doing our, we're not doing our work. So I'm going to kick it over to Kristen. Um, she's going to let you know a little bit more about some of the work that she's been doing in the community um, that's specific to the film festivals. So. Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Kristen Reeves, and um, I'm going to be focusing on um, thinking about engagement through the actual curation and organizational process itself, uh, and really echoing a lot of what um, Aaron and, and Natalie have already kind of said a lot um, that I think this builds upon. And so when we talk about um, programming for experimental um, film festivals, artist made film festivals, we're talking about also media arts festivals. Um, and thinking about the, the different subcategories of those um, different uh, communities, like um, that has mentioned before, is really important. Um, and so when I'm talking about what might be successful, um, I'm really thinking about how um, these communities then kind of come together where the event itself has a community, right? So um, where artists might transcend and become the, the um, audience themselves or the um, what we might identify as the local audience um, becomes the organizer. And how do these things um, co-mingle so that we can have authentic professional um, uh, events? And when I say authentic, I mean not, um, not saying, oh, we have to check these boxes off or we have to exclude a certain type of content versus not um, uh, another type of content, but rather um, making sure through the, again, the curatorial process, the organizational process, that these things are um, virtues in supporting each other. I'm going to kind of skip ahead. I have some experience here um, in relationship to my background in academia, intermedia art. Um, and also I'm a professor at Ball State University. Um, but my colleague, Maura Jasper, uh, she started um, that one film festival in Muncie uh, along with the support of Brady Ulis and who was the former MAC executive director. Uh, and they brought me in in 2018 to be the programming, um, uh, the programming director of that one film festival because of some previous experience while they um, served in those leadership roles. And um, my education in film festival programming and curation, a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you, those nuts and bolts, are um, 
come from my experience at Flex, Florida Experimental Film Festival. Uh, and so I just want to give a shout out to them. And I think the thing that makes me feel really confident about this, um, this sort of process I'm sharing is that Flex, even though um, it started in Gainesville, Florida, but now it's in Tampa, um, and it's really um, uh, shifted hands over the years with different leaders. And so the community within this organization um, is vital. And I think that's important. So nuts and bolts here. So first, communicating a clear artistic direction is really important, your North Star. But then again, considering all the communities when you make that um, uh, direction, which means actually giving them a seat at the table. So inviting representatives to um, to actually come up with uh, with that direction and implement it. Um, and then given it clear expectations of time. So if uh, and and having the door open for a variety of different types of time um, and interest uh, at the same time. <laughs> so, uh, for example, with myself, I started at Flex as an audience member and I had an hour to watch some films and I got hooked. And so I started showing some more things. And then at these events, people said, hey, uh, we need volunteers. Do you want to be a screener? Do you want to come to this event? Um, and then through these different channels, I became more involved, I became educated, and I became a participant, again, from audience. Um, and then, uh, so building on your volunteers experience, maybe that they know people that and that experience can be helpful to bring in um, others. And, um, and also thinking about when you bring in like other jurors, outside jurors, so we have a competitive component of that one film festival in Muncie, and also with Flex, um, and so that involved um, experts in the field uh, to come in after the selection was made to uh, provide awards, but do they align also with the those sorts of commitments you have um, when you bring them in, that's important to the to think about and also actually tell them what those are um, before they join it. So. Um, so yeah, this is just an example of some, some of the individuals that you might include in a selection committee. Um, and so with films, it's also a type of time commitment because you're saying, uh, you know, there might be 45 hours of films or 80 hours of films to watch. Breaking that up and again, finding out what people's times are, like commitments can be, uh, being accommodating and also being realistic. Uh, and so with uh, all the festivals I've been involved with, the artistic directors watch all the films but then we make sure that at least two or more people within the sort of subcategories of the communities get a chance to watch everything so their voices are heard, making sure there's ways to actually communicate that when we say at the table, not everyone can be there all the time. Um, back in the day, it was ex uh, Excel spreadsheets we'd email, but now we have wonderful tools like um, Film Freeway that are out there. And this is just one example of one rubric for one festival, but it could change and um, lots of uh, ways to, again, communicate. Um, and, and so some of the things that were really important in terms of just not having it in writing, but actually having events uh, involving food, because no one wants to watch films hungry, uh, and uh, learning and educating through like, let's have an orientation session, let's learn about what this film, what these films are, what our um, goals are, and then um, giving them again a seat at the table to where uh, the decisions aren't just listened to, but actually felt, right? So in the final decision making for all the festivals I've been in, we really kind of take a look at, okay, what's below the, the time amount that we can um, serve? Uh, and then what voices, um, what voices uh, do we have all the different voices, right? From, from these different sub communities, um, is somebody really uh, an advocate for a certain film, but maybe it's below the cut, why? Let's um, find out and make sure that that is something that again, goes back to that North Star of our rubric, our artistic direction, our community direction. Um, and it, it, that takes time, but it's really very rewarding. Um, red flags, uh, things like, oh, should I show this film because that person's really um, established uh, individual or should we have to, do we need to show this film because we, we know that person, they're friends, you start becoming friends with everyone, right? So um, just making sure that those things are considered. Um, and, and also being clear, everyone's going to be disappointed, I guess, in some ways, when you participate in this sort of curatorial process that I've been involved in, you know, um, there's just not a time uh, enough to support every film, right? And so just also being clear with that. And that was really important to me when I was coming up through the ranks of film festival programming to hear, um, you know, maybe the first year I could only watch 
uh, 10 hours of films instead of 75. And maybe none of those films made it in the festival. Well, why should I participate again? Well, it was still important for me to watch those films to communicate. And sometimes too, um, there's also films, and, and I'm sure we've if, if you've curated any kind of art programming, um, and when you submit something, it doesn't mean that it's not good um, or it's not valuable, but maybe it just didn't fit that time, but maybe we could fit you in another time or for a solo program or as an invited guest, or maybe you wanna be a, um, a film screener yourself. So lots of different open windows and again, being clear about that. And then um, outreach uh, throughout the years. So these are just a few examples to, um, to keep film festivals flowing and, um, and vital uh, by yeah, programming other things and reaching out to other organizations that might not be the film festival. Um, uh, that might only happen in my case. Uh, a lot of the ones I've been involved with happen maybe every other year because they're so time um, heavy. Um, but yeah, what else can, can keep it alive? All right, so I want to thank everyone for being here and my co-presenters. If you have any questions, we'd really like to open up our um, last bit of time for, for you to ask them. And everybody feel free to use the chat or turn on your mic and your video. This is, this is your time. Lovely good job, ladies, by the way, just lovely. Any questions? Poor Kristen, I thought you were gonna hurt yourself going th flying through those last- Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that was clear. I was like, I wanna give us some time. <laughs> Any questions for anybody? It was a lot to absorb, I know. It's, it, it, <laughs> it takes a minute. You guys are doing some great, just an extraordinary amount of work and congratulations on the NEA. That's lovely. Well, I tell you what, are you guys going to share the, the slides? Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I'd be happy to share, share the slides, um, my, my portion and there you gosh. go. So we'll share the slides, which have contact information. And then there's a, couple a couple, of there's a couple of questions coming in. If we still have a few minutes here. Um, Excellent. What's have gotten delayed in the, the stack. So Caitlin um, asks about how we identify artists with an interest in community. Um, and so that was that was about, I think, the Play Space program. You know, we, we put calls out for artists to sort of self describe themselves, but we are not um, super specific about what we're looking for. So we really love to um, to learn about what people want to do. So a lot of artists who want to work in the community and be involved in those sorts of community outreach relationships don't always have that experience already, but they know they want to do it. And so they can come to us as an applicant um, to do a project. And it's really more about what kind of project do they want to do rather than what's the experience level. Um, again, depending on what their background is. Um, we obviously wouldn't put somebody in like a mental health facility if we didn't think that they would be able to, you know, do that work. But, um, but integrating people into the community is otherwise pretty easy. Um, another question here says, how do you find out barriers of reaching um, out? Find out the barriers of reaching to the community. So what are the barriers? Natalie, do you have any ideas? For me, it's really just been trial and error. Um, screwing up basically has been how I've sort of figured out what those barriers are and correcting. Um, so just kind of trial and error and just understanding when, when you sort of made a mistake and when you should be more open about a certain thing. Um, so yeah, it's, for me, it's just been experience over the years, over time. Always better to admit to a mistake than to try to cover it, right? I mean, exactly. <laughs> so much more grace than that. I think barriers, you know, figuring out what those barriers are going to be also comes with time and just working in the community. I can, I can tell a, like a quick anecdote. I worked um, on a project where we were doing these sort of paste paper murals um, at different locations. And I thought the project was so great. And I didn't know who in the world would say no to a temporary paste paper project on their building. And I remember going to speak with a business about it and I got a pretty, a, 
abrupt and aggressive response that was like, what are you doing here? And why are you trying to do this in our, in our neighborhood? And I, I remember at the first, it was right after I moved to Muncie and I was really put off at, at initially because I was like, why are they being so rude to me? I'm just trying to offer them something for free. Like, why would they be so rude? But, you know, the more you reflect on it, then you realize that that's a, a community area that, you know, anytime people have come into that neighborhood and said, we want to give you something for free, they've had to give something back that they didn't want to give. And they've had to do work back that they didn't want to do. So that's been really um, informative for me to kind of realize that, you know, each area of our, of our city has a very, very different ecosystem going on. And they all, um, you know, have wants and needs that we have to be 100% responsible for and listen to. Um, so I think that's how you find those barriers is by listening. It looks like there's one more question, maybe for Kristen, we could take this one. This is uh, from Sally. Where do you find artists to collaborate with? How do you reach out to them and establish those relationships? I find um, being, you know, being a participant in whatever it is that that artist is involved or what other artists are involved in. So showing up um, and getting to know that getting to know them, getting to know their work, um, and showing that you have that sort of authentic connection there. Um, so networking. Um, and I think this, these sorts of things like the, the homecoming, this, this right now is, is part of that. Right. Um, so, uh, I find that to be really, really important. Um, and it, you know, and I think it's one of those things too, where sometimes, uh, I work with students. So sometimes it might seem, uh, a little bit of, uh, maybe a negative, like you have to know people to make things happen. But really, it's like, look around you, who who are your, your friends doing things, they become your friends, or they become your colleagues. Um, that That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like, it's not necessarily a barrier. But just, um, so yeah, that, that sort of networking, participating. Um, and I think Zoom and being able to do some of these things um, online has actually of course COVID is horrible but like at the same time I think some of this has added a little accessibility for people outside of what we would identify as um you know uh, just a local community or um, that sort of access has expanded so when I think about communities and I, I like what I was saying in in my presentation I really think about the community within the event um and the community uh, like branching, just kind of keep these different layers um, on top of it, each other. So um, that's how I've done that. All right. Well, I hate to do it, but we've got a tight turnaround on this on the schedule for the next session. So thank you so much, everybody, um, for attending and for presenting. The recording will be available in a couple of weeks. And um, I hope you have a fabulous rest of day and whatever other sessions you decide to go to. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.